All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for being here on this Monday afternoon. This is a quick rundown of how the textbook transformation grants application process goes. Uh, everything from the definition to what the grants are, all the way through how to apply if you're a mini grantee and how to apply if you're a standard scale or large scale textbook transformation grants uh, applicant. At one point, if you're going to just be a mini grantee, um, then what you'll want to do, I'll, I'll put a, a little bit of a mark in here for when you're not, uh, when you don't have to necessarily be in the webinar anymore, because what I'll do is define everything and then run through how the mini grant process works, and then the last part is going to be how the standard scale process works. So if you're unable to to attend the whole thing and you're a mini grantee, you can leave a little bit early. Um, yep, yeah, and I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. So textbook transformation grants are a way for us to encourage faculty throughout our system to adopt affordable materials, particularly open educational resources, but also library resources, uh, other no-cost resources that aren't open licensed, and low-cost resources in the classroom. Um, this is an opt-in kind of policy where we, we really want to bring people in and uh, who are interested in adopting OER and other materials as opposed to doing some sort of mandate. Uh, we really want to make sure that this is something that supports people who have a really good idea um, as opposed to imposing an idea on anyone. Uh, so that's why, that's why we do grants as opposed to another method. Now the way that it works is we are funding the time that it takes to get this work done. And the work that's going to get done is going to be on your proposal. And how that time is covered depends on your institution. I see that there are a few people who dialed in on the phone. Um, that's totally fine. Uh, if you're unable to see the screen, that's also OK. We'll be sharing these slides on the Round 16 RFP webpage on affordablelearninggeorgia.org afterwards. So if you miss anything, we'll have both the video with auto captioning and the slides as well. So the request for proposals has already been out and it already has the timeline in there. The deadline for applications for round 16 is January 13th, 2020. Uh, that should give you a little bit of time after the break to get everybody together once again uh, after uh, the winter break and kind of team up, check out the uh, status of your application and then submit it. Uh, peer review runs through two weeks after that, so that's January 14th through the 30th. Notification should get sent out the day after peer reviews end on January 31st. Um, that's after the administrative reviews end, of course, too. Uh, on February 24th, it, that is the date for the kickoff meeting, and that is at Middle Georgia State University, uh, right in Macon, Georgia, at the Hatcher Conference Center. Uh, if you are a standard scale or large scale grantee, um, set this date aside if you want to uh, apply. Because if you do apply and if you do receive that award, then at least two of your team members need to participate in that kickoff meeting. Uh, these all started on our first round of grants all the way back in round one. And it's a great way to bring the cohort together um, for them to meet different players in the uh, ALG and OER worlds, including the University of North Georgia Press, OpenStax, and uh, the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation at Georgia State, which is an accessibility organization. You learn a little bit about open, a little bit about copyright, a lot about accessibility, and um, how the press can help, and what OpenStax is all about, if you're uh, not familiar with that. So uh, the online kickoff uh, for many grants is only about an hour, hour and a half long, depending on how many questions we have. So if you're a mini grant uh, applicant, that is not required to go to the make-in meeting, but you are welcome to. So that is a little bit about the timeline. And if you're going to be a standard or large scale 
applicant, be sure to reserve February 24th, 2020 for a meeting from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in Macon, Georgia for the kickoff meeting. So the next thing uh, we'll do is run through what textbook transformation grants are um, for the standard and large scale. Then we'll go through the mini grants. So we started out with one kind of grant in ALG. It's a standard scale grant. Um, it's 5000 maximum per team member and a $10,800 maximum award. Within these applications, you need to have $800 set aside for travel and overall project expenses. Um, this ensures that you have the funding in place to attend the kickoff meeting. Um, usually within your institution, that's done through reimbursement. Um, and it's a required part of the budget. If you do not spend $800 on travel, which a lot of people will not spend $800 on travel, um, you can use that for overall project expenses too. Things like the purchasing of uh, software to create open uh, educational resources, um, additional travel funding that fits the scope of your statement of work, your proposal, the service level agreement. Um, you know, sharing things uh, with a particular community through a conference, that kind of stuff is really cool and you, you're able to do that through this funding. Now for standard scale, um, it, this was our initial uh, bit of funding. So if you have a team, uh, one or more people uh, within the team, uh, within you could do one course, you could do multiple courses. Uh, usually you're going to do more than one section unless you have like a really big super section, but that's not usually the case. Um, and this one covers everything under 500 students enrolled on, uh, on average per academic year total. So these are most of the applications that we get are standard scale textbook transformation grants. Now large scale came in a couple of rounds later. We are hearing from faculty that it's fine for people to have a, a small team with that amount of grant funding, but let's say that you wanted to bring in an entire department. If you were going to bring in an entire department, you would need a lot of people on board, not only to create resources or to redesign a course, but maybe even to agree on what it is that's being taught and then collectively evaluate the materials that are out there. Uh, a lot of meetings would be involved. And so a uh, large scale transformation is, uh, it has a larger maximum to accommodate more team members. It's still $5,000 maximum per team member. There's still $800 for travel and overall project expenses because at least two team members need to attend the kickoff meeting at Middle Georgia State. Um, if you want to bring along more, if you've got five people uh, that want to attend the kickoff meeting, that's awesome. Uh, it, but two people need to be there. And yeah, so the, the maximum award and the maximum per team member, uh, that's where it... <sighs> The, the maximum award is where it differs. The maximum per team member doesn't change. So if you have other project costs, you can incorporate these into the grant as well. Um, usually what, what we are funding is faculty time to get something done, and then we're funding travel and overall project expenses. If you need to still work within the per team member maximum, but set some funding aside for uh, an authoring tool, like let's say you wanted to have a Pressbooks instance, um, you can do that within the grant. You just have to make it very clear what that's going to do within the narrative and make it clear to reviewers in the budget section what it's going to be, why this stuff is necessary within your plan. If you have a very <laughs> detailed written out plan and then right in the budget you have a platform that was never mentioned, then peer reviewers will look at that and go, what's going on here? Um, so just avoid the what's going on here question and uh, make sure that you're just very clear if you're going to add something like that into your budget section. Okay, so we went through the basics of what a standard scale and a large scale textbook transformation grant are. 
Within the application process, there are a couple of strategic priorities that we are targeting that will give you um, a few extra points onto <laughs> your application. Now that's a few. If you have a really good application that wins over the peer reviewers very well, uh, the strategic priority, if you, if you don't have that on there, a great application is still a great application. You will most likely see an award if you've really gotten a great peer review score. Um, if you're around the middle, those extra couple of points may help. So these are not criteria that absolutely need to be met in order for you to apply. They're not quote unquote optional uh, categories that have that are actually required in order to get through a competitive round it's it's none of that it is a slight bump if you meet these priorities but the best thing to have in any round of textbook transformation grants is a great proposal so the first one is to address core curriculum courses that haven't seen a USG implementation at all um, ones that just haven't seen it and so these are ones that change every year we we look at the list of core curriculum courses that have been addressed before the academic year turns around and then we look at which ones haven't yet been addressed so this list is on the RFP if you have a core curriculum course that isn't on this list, for example, uh, Introduction to Psychology, then that one doesn't count towards specific core curriculum courses because that one has already been addressed somewhere. Uh, but if you have a British Literature 2 course or Elementary Greek or uh, Introduction to Archaeology, uh, that would be a big one that's highly enrolled. Introduction to Ethics as well, State and Local Government, um, Accounting, Physical Science 1. Um, these will change per year as they are addressed, but for now this is the list. So if any of your courses meet this, they will get a slight bump in the scores because it meets a priority category. Um, if you have a Gateways to Completion course, then you know you have a Gateways to Completion course. Uh, these are very institution specific. They're part of a statewide program that is about these gateway courses that are uh, that really ensure that students uh, succeed in the classroom. Basically, if they do well in this class, they will do well throughout. Uh, it's kind of done through transcripts analysis and things like that. So if you're wondering if you have a Gateways to Completion course, uh, then you probably don't have one because you've been Gateways to Completion has this whole participation thing around it, and it's all around course redesign. That's why we moved in with our textual transformation grants, because it's all about course redesign. And if you can design your course with low-cost or no-cost materials, um, you know, send in an application to um, uh, for our grants, and we can integrate our funding with the whole process going on at G2C. For scaling up OER, this is for projects that may have had a smaller group uh, starting out. So for example, when we first started, uh, we had a lot of projects that were maybe two faculty members in a department uh, putting OER into a psychology course for just their sections. The rest of the department didn't take that on. It was just that team. Um, at that point, if you already had a course that was already addressed by a grant within that institution you couldn't really get another one but if you're going to scale up that OER implementation to department-wide all sections then that is a way to get a new grant and that is part of why we put this in the priority categories we really want to take the successes of the first couple of rounds the past and grow them into even bigger things should the department say yes we want to uh, do this and here's our plan so that's what scaling up OER is all about if you had a uh, a grant at your institution and you want to move that up to a department-wide all-section scale this is the category for that upper level uh, campus collaborations is a new one we saw in our previous surveys and 
uh, kind of nationwide when it came to OER implementations. There, there just isn't too much OER in upper level courses and uh, in graduate level courses. So that really eliminates a lot of the options for no cost and low cost materials in these upper level courses. Um, what uh, this covers is either a single institution or a multi-institution project uh, where upper level courses are being addressed, anything 3000 level through graduate and doctoral courses. Um, this we really like to encourage uh, with multi-institution projects because often these upper level courses do not have a huge amount of enrollment. Uh, but even then, uh, if you teamed up with a couple of institutions, you may be affecting a lot of students within that one project. Because of this, because teaming up with another institution isn't department-wide, and it isn't all sections, it's not something that stands out as a large-scale uh, grant sometimes, you could still take the three uh, the thirty thousand dollar maximum because you may have a lot of people involved in a multi-campus collaboration. Um, that is the difference here uh, with upper level. Upper level functions a little bit differently from everything else. You still get priority points, but if you are a multi-institution project, you could take the $30,000 option here uh, for maximum instead of the uh, $10,800 maximum. Now that gets a little confusing because we already have priority categories and they work one way. Upper level works a little bit differently. If you have an upper level course and it's not multi-institution, you can still get priority points for that. It's still a priority of ours to address upper level courses, um, but you won't be able to just bump up your uh, proposal to large scale funding if it doesn't meet uh, the student or department wide requirements. If you have an upper level course that's multi-institution, you still get those priority points and you can take the large-scale $30,000 funding uh, option. So this is to account for the kinds of expenses that go into this. Meetings that don't just have to happen you know, in somebody's office, but long distance. There's a lot of extra work that goes into multi-institution collaboration. So that's why uh, you're able to do that. So before we move on to mini grants, I just want to move it over to uh, to all of you. Do you have any questions about uh, standard scale or large scale textbook transformation grants? Either type it in the chat or you can unmute your mic and just ask it uh, through audio. Okay, it is quiet so far, so I think we're doing well. Um, just to clarify for those of you who just joined us on the phone, because I see a few more phones popping up here, uh, we will be making these slides available on the RFP page for round 16, right where the webinar link used to be. And so you'll be able to get the slides and the archived video of this entire um, meeting. So if you're not able to see things while you're on the phone today, that's okay. You'll be able to catch all the visuals uh, right on our site. So mini grants work a little bit differently. Um, the reason why we have mini grants is because not only is getting uh, no cost and low cost materials into the classroom a priority for us, but we also want to make sure that that's sustainable and that it's easier for more people to adopt these materials later on down the line. And that has to do with increasing the quality and the support for these materials. So um, if you have existing open resources out there that you would like to create new ancillary materials for, um, or resources that you would like to, oh, I'm hearing an echo. What I'm going to do very quickly is mute the audience. Um, if you want to unmute, uh, just unmute your microphone on Skype or dial star six if you're on the phone. Uh, yeah, so with mini grants, what we're trying to encourage here is 
updating currently existing um, open educational resources or creating new ones that support open textbooks. So for example, we've had teams create an entire video series for uh, a history course and then go on to create an entire video series for a second history course. That was over at Georgia Highlands. They have a, a YouTube channel uh, dedicated to that. So that was really cool. Um, that kind of stuff is what we love to see in many grants. Even taking all the stuff that you've already created, making it accessible, uh, making it downloadable, putting an open license on it, and then we can release it in the form of an open course, an open textbook. Those kinds of improvement projects are what mini grants are all about. So these aren't about changing your course, putting uh, uh, OER into your course and saying, okay, now I am saving students a lot of money because they used to pay for a commercial textbook. That's our standard scale and our large scale textbook transformation grants. The mini grants are all about ancillary materials creation and revision. Now, using the power of open because you can revise and remix. Um, just for a couple of definitions here, revision is not just uh, changing a file format and uh, being done with it at that point or fixing a couple of typos and then all of a sudden it's fine. Um, this is a major adaptation, changing things for uh, the currency of the uh, content that's in there, accuracy, um, accessibility, the uh, instructional design of it, the graphic design of it, uh, formats that are much more compatible with uh, new devices, that type of stuff uh, can help out here. And ancillary materials we define as materials that will substantially support instruction with existing OER. So it, for example, the stuff that I had already mentioned before, um, we don't want just a collection of PowerPoint lecture slides. Uh, if you have a uh, narrated video lecture slides that then kind of address everything in a, a new way, kind of make them accessible um, when you have both visuals and audio, you've got a video series that uses PowerPoint, that's totally fine. Um, but what we want is some really substantial stuff that will support somebody else teaching with these materials, kind of passing that openness along to um, uh, more instructors who look at these texts and say, well, I, I would love to use this, but I don't have all of the uh, side bells and whistles that usually help me get through this class. Uh, you know, I need a set of lecture slides. I need a set of videos. I need, um, you know, updated photos or uh, a practice question bank or something like that. Now the deliverables are a little bit different for. Uh, mini grants than they are for standard scale. With standard scale you have a final report, it's a really big narrative report. Um, you also have a photo of the team, you have an analysis of the qualitative and quantitative data, and we'll get into the application process a little bit uh, later. But with mini grants it's a little bit different. You have a smaller final report and you're releasing the materials um, under uh, by default, a Creative Commons attribution license, which means that you can revise it, you can remix it um, with the permission of the creators kind of given immediately, uh, so long as you attribute the original work. So people can go in and revise and remix stuff and tailor it to their own courses um, so long as they uh, attribute the original work. Now there are exceptions, of course. If you're going to revise uh, any kind of OER that has a share-alike restriction on there, that means you have to share it under that exact license, and we won't break that. Well, we will share it under that same license, along with uh, non-commercial as well. So that's just the differences between the standard scale stuff and the mini grants. So now we'll go into the details as to how this all works. So with funding, these are not direct stipends that go to the team uh, the way that some federal grants and uh, non-governmental organization grants work. This is an agreement between us and the institution that this work that's on your application is going to get done. So um, it goes through a service level agreement and 50% of the funding is given upon execution of that service level agreement and then 50% is given at the, f at the end when the final report is released. 
there's 800 that's specifically designated for two team members or more to attend the required in-person kickoff meeting when it comes to our standard scale and large scale grants. So a little bit of additional stuff on how funding works. Because uh, this is going to be an institution uh, agreement, someone is going to be taking care of the fund disbursement. Usually that is the institutional sponsor, the one that uh, signs the letter that's in your application. Um, budgets, uh, because of that, are, well, they're all supported by state funds. That ALG is a state fund. Uh, organization. And so because of that, the money that we are uh, funding you with, that needs to be spent within state guidelines, Board of Regents guidelines, and also your institution's guidelines. Um, that means different things to different institutions. Uh, some institutions will uh, easily help you out with a course release or with overload pay or with summer pay. Other institutions uh, cannot do that through uh, their entire institution-wide policy and they may instead uh, fund things like professional development. Uh, that really depends on the institution that you're at. Um, being in contact with your grants or research office if you have one or your business office if you don't um, will Eliminate surprises down the line the earlier that you get in contact with them about this. So for application procedures, I'm going to start with mini grants because that's the easy one. Then we'll go into standard scale and large scale. And if you're a mini grantee and you have to leave early, you can after the mini grant part is all over because after that it's all standard scale stuff um, unless you want to ask some live questions, which is totally welcome. Um, and of course, you can always email me at Jeff W uh, at Jeff dot Gallant at USG edu, which I'll type in the chat right now. Oh, that didn't work very well in the captioning. Okay, so I'm going to take you quickly through what the application form looks like, and in order to do that, I'm going to change the screen that I'm sharing. So I will change it over to the primary monitor. Here we go. So this part unfortunately doesn't have uh, auto captioning, but I'm just going to be showing you a little bit of what the OER revisions and ancillary materials creation mini grant application is all about. There is an explanation of exactly what uh, these grants are, including what deliverables are expected, and the definitions of what revision and ancillary materials are. So here we're not asking as much as you may have seen in a standard scale application. Uh, we're asking for your name, the position, institution, email address. Uh, be sure to type your email address correctly or else we will never be able to get back to you. Um, sometimes I can go and find out what went wrong. Sometimes I can't, especially if you're new. Um, any other team members, so be sure to provide their names and email addresses here so that uh, they are on my contact list along with you. Um, the type of project, are you going to be just revising pre-existing OER? Are you going to be creating ancillary materials? If it's both or if it's something new, you can put it under other. Um, course numbers and course titles, these just go hand in hand. Um, they're separate so that I can easily copy them into an Excel sheet and have them uh, useful. Final semester of the project, that's either going to be uh, fall 2020 or spring 2021. Uh, the end of the final semester is when this stuff is due. If you've taken a look at uh, the deadlines in the past, that's how it usually works. For example, the end of fall 2020 is usually right at the end of December. The proposed grant funding amount, um, this is a maximum of $4,800 if you have more than one team member. It's a maximum of $2,000 per team member and $800 for project expenses. So here you're just putting in the proposed grant funding amount. Uh, currently existing resources to be revised and ancillaries created. So let's say that um, it's going to be OpenStax Biology 2nd Edition. Uh, you would just put the link in here in the title and you'd be good to go. If you've got a lot of resources that you're going to be revising for a big open course project, that may be a longer list. 
Now the project description, this is where the, the meat of the proposal is. You'll be talking about what you're doing here, uh, what the goals are, how you're going to get there, what the deliverables are at the end. And even though this is one line, uh, Google Forms works a little bit weirdly here. So if I'm like doing this, I can hit enter, and here's another line. You can type forever. You can have a lot of paragraphs here, and it just keeps going. Um, that way, you're able to type in your entire description. Uh, you can also just type something into Word and just paste it right in here. Um, it looks like it's supposed to be a, a short answer question, but it isn't. You can type as long as you want. It's at least one paragraph. We want some really big descriptions of what's going to happen. Uh, timeline and personnel. So this is about what is your timeline? Uh, what are the major milestones that are going to happen? Who are the roles uh, of each team member going to be? Is someone uh, a project manager? Is someone going to be an instructional designer on the project? Um, are people going to co-project lead or something like that? That's really important here. And the timeline kind of weaves into that. Someone is going to get this done by this period of time. Uh, on March 19th, 2020, we'll have a meeting and get together and discuss what we've already done. Those types of things are going to be listed here in the timeline. And then the budget, uh, this isn't just what you're asking for, but it's a breakdown of the costs. If that's just 2000 for uh, each team member, uh, and here's what their roles are, and then uh, 800 for overall project expenses, that's totally fine. 800 is not required here. Um, many grantees are not required to attend an in-person meeting, so you don't have to have that extra 800 on there. But if you're going to purchase any supplies, um, any platforms to improve these materials, which, which often happens, especially if you're going to take high quality photos for like a biology project, you, you may need some equipment on that. Um, on that end. So that's why the 800 there, it, it's not required, but you can do it. But be sure to clarify what that's for here under the budget. Uh, and then the Creative Commons terms, uh, yeah, so by default, these are CC BY with exceptions for modifications for pre existing resources with a more restrictive license. Yeah, it's state funding, so we want to make sure that we're sharing it out and making it open. Any questions about the mini grants before I move on? Okay, so I will move on to uh, how standard scale and large scale textbook transformation grants get applied for. If you need to leave early and you're a mini grant person, you can totally do that now. Um, the rest of this is going to be discussing how to apply for standard scale and large scale textbook transformation grants. So for mini grants, we just have that Google form that's linked in the RFP. That is the required element for the proposal. But for standard scale and large scale, there's more to it. Um, first of all, you have to complete the proposal application. That's an info-ready review. But first, what you'll want to do is the Word version. This helps out because there's instructions in italics that we can put in the Word version that just cannot be put into info-ready review. Those italics uh, tell you exactly what we're looking for. Um, for example, if you look at project goals, and you just type it into info-ready review, uh, you may just think, oh, our goals are to um, write an open textbook or to put an open textbook in the classroom and save students money. But what we're really looking for under project goals is a little different from that. So you'll want to read that in the Word document. Be sure to fill out the Word document first and then move that over to InfoReady Review. Especially then you have a hard copy of your own proposal that you can always refer to. You'll need a letter of support that is from the sponsor. Um, that letter is usually from an area of administration above yours. So uh, if it's the uh, if you're teaching within your particular uh, inst uh, within your your course, but 
you don't have like administrators on the team or something like that, then it would probably be your dean who's the sponsor. If your dean is on the team because it's a big department-wide thing and they're fully invested in it, um, then your dean would not be the sponsor because your dean's on the team. At that point, you'd want to go further up. Your dean should know who that is, probably a vice president for academic affairs or a provost. Uh, both of them have applied in the past, and that's been fine. Uh, if you have multi-institution teams, you need a letter of support from each institution sponsoring area. That's because we really don't want any uh, projects to start up and then having uh, people who are their direct supervisors going, what happened? I was never told about this. Uh, they need to know about it and they need to be totally on board for it in order for this to happen. Uh, it needs to be a signed letter as a result. And so with multi-institutions, we don't want just one institution signing the document and then the other institution not knowing that this was going to happen. Because all of a sudden, they will see a service level agreement. And if they see a service level agreement and haven't uh, been informed of what was going to happen, the uh, at the very least, the process may be uh, taking a longer time. So the first thing that you want to do is bookmark the About page, which is the RFP for R16. And so I will just put this right in the chat for you. There it is. Um, I already put it in a little bit earlier, but just in case. So that is the Round 16 RFP. You can always go back to it. Not only does it have the online proposal stuff in there, but it has um, our slides from today, the uh, archived conversation from today as well. So these things will be right there on the site for you. And you'll want to finish the the uh, Word document proposal first, the .docx uh, version, and then uh, go into the Info Ready Review one. So let me just show you a little bit about this here. I will share my desktop on the primary monitor again and go into the round 16 page. And in here, you can see the request for proposals document. That's the downloadable RFP. And then there's the weighted rubric for peer review. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But here's the Word version of the application form. This is very important because what you'll need here are the stuff that's in italics. Um, this all explains all of the data that you're going to be putting in uh, the project goals. For example, these go beyond just cost savings. Include goals for student savings, student success, materials creation, and pedagogical transformation here. Um, here's what the statement of transformation should have. Here's all the stuff a transformation action plan should have. Stuff you'll need to consider for quantitative and qualitative measures, including the IRB. Uh, the timeline, how the timeline should look. The budget, how the budget should look. Um, be sure to put these in a bullet point list. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And the sustainability plan. How will this be carried forward? And a little note about the letter of support. So that's why you really want to go through the Word version first. You won't see these italics on the uh, Info Ready Review version of this. So now I'll go back over to my slides on Monitor 2. Okay, so once you're done with all of that and you want to go in, create your uh, InfoReady Review account, and start applying, the first thing you do is you click on Login on the top right part of the screen. Um, if you are not from Georgia Tech, then just click on the Register button under Login for Other Users, and you'll create an account. Uh, you put in your first name, last name, email address, and password. Uh, there's a CAPTCHA thing to make sure you're not a robot, uh, and that's it. Then you just hit Create Account, and you'll get an email that says that you've created it. Uh, this little confirmation box will pop up, letting you know as well. If you're a Georgia Tech user, usually you're in luck. If you just click on Georgia Tech Login, the single sign-on feature should work. Uh, for your Georgia Tech stuff. Now there there has been an instance at Georgia Tech 
where one Georgia Tech person had three different Georgia Tech email addresses, that was a big problem. If that happens, let me know and I'll get in contact with the InfoReady team to see what they can do. They will probably have to merge those accounts into one, uh, at least when it comes to InfoReady review. Look out for an email from at georgiatech.edu. This is from Susan Roach's email address. She is the main administrator for the InfoReady platform. If you have a, a really protective email inbox, be sure to whitelist the domain gatech.edu before you apply because you'll be getting email at, uh, emails from us and emails from Georgia Tech email addresses because of this platform. Now, if you do not find an email from geotech.edu and you've put in your email correctly and everything should have been going right, um, check your junk mail just in case because these are kind of form emails and sometimes all form emails get sent into junk, which is a problem because uh, platforms that are actually important to you can't reach you that way. Uh, so be sure to either whitelist at geotech.edu or keep an eye on your junk mail. Now, if you don't have a direct link to uh, the application itself, uh, there is one in the RFP. There's one in the, RF, the RFP site. But let's say that you don't. Let's say that you just go on to Info Ready Review. Scroll down on the front page all the way down to the last one because that's where our textbook transformation grants are. The reason why it is is because we are the University System of Georgia, and these are uh, alphabetized by the organization. So we're under U and that is always at the end. So that's why uh, it's tough to find us sometimes. But if you need to find us from the front page, just scroll down. So let me show you what the application form looks like. Uh, I'm just going to jump in there for a second. So I'll set this up for you and then show you what it looks like uh, from within. As soon as it loads, okay, so now I'm going to just transfer over the screen again. Sorry about all this uh, screen transferring. I just want to make sure that you see the live document. Here you go. So here is where you put in personal details. Uh, the applicant and the submitter are sometimes different people, sometimes not. If you are filling out your own application, then the applicants and the submitter are the same person. Just put in the same, uh, the same information on both things. If your grants office or an administrator or a campus champion is submitting this for you, then the applicant is you and the submitter is the campus champion or the grants office or whoever it is that's submitting it on your behalf. So that's the difference here. You're the applicant. Sometimes you're the submitter and sometimes you're not, but you're always the applicant. Uh, for the application details, um, there's the proposal title. You don't have to be too unique with this title. You don't have to be too creative. Uh, you don't have to come up with the best dad joke in the world on OER. You don't have to do an OER pun uh, because what we're going to do is delete that title and put in a number. That number is going to indicate to us exactly which application this is. If it gets awarded, it is that number grant. So it kind of follows you for the entire life cycle of the project. So don't worry too much about the proposal title. You can put something in here about, you know, OER in this course, something like that. Uh, the requested amount of funding. So this is where you put in the amount that you're requesting for the budget. Um, the priority category, if applicable, this can be upper level courses. This can be scaling up OER, but put uh, none NA if it doesn't meet that, that's also totally fine. Like I said, the best uh, way to get an award is to have a great application that peer reviewers love. If you meet a priority category, it just helps a little. The final semester, fall 2020 or spring 2021, make sure that this final semester meets up with the timeline. If your timeline says that you're submitting the final report at the end of summer 2022, and you say that your final semester is fall 2020 or spring 2021, which are the ones that qualify, then things do not line up. Uh, your final semester has a final report at the end of it. Just be clear that that's what's going to be submitted. Um, the course titles, course numbers, same as the mini grant, just put them in here. Uh, 
Team members, if you have four team members, put in their name and email. Makes it a lot easier for me to put everybody on the contact list. But if you have like eight team members, then keep putting them in down here in additional team members. Uh, sponsor name, sponsor title, sponsor, sponsor department. This is all the person who uh, writes and signs the letter. Now this stuff can be very confusing if you haven't already done it on the Word version of the sheet. Please do the Word version first. There's italics that describe all of this. Uh, if you're using an OpenStax textbook, select Yes here. And if you're thinking about it, you don't have to select it. It's not going to affect the application in any way other than once something's awarded, I'll get to see who says they're using an OpenStax textbook and send that over to Nicole Finkbeiner at OpenStax so she can help you get a faculty account and extra uh, instructor materials and things like that. So it's just an easy way for us to link you up with OpenStax if you're using it. Project goals, statement of transformation, these are the big sections here. Transformation, action plan, measures, timeline, budget, sustainability plan. This is the meat and potatoes or the vegetarian meat and potatoes of the project. Uh, the RFP and the Word document really illustrate what we want here. You can see that there's no instructional information here because we can't put it on there. Uh, that's why we really want you to do the Word document first. Timeline and budget, a lot of people love to use tables here. Do not use tables and please do not copy tables from Word and then paste them in here. It sometimes breaks Info Ready Review and then peer reviewers aren't able to view your application. It, if the table goes over the boundaries of the page, the rest of the words go off the boundary of the page and then all of a sudden you can only see half the application. It's really silly. I don't like it. I keep complaining about it, but there's never there's never been a really easy fix for it either. So I will sometimes have to go in and fix it myself, uh, but to prevent any confusion, be sure to just use a bullet point list instead of a, a table when it comes to this stuff. Um, yeah, and then the letter of support, you can upload it right here. If there's more than one letter of support, you can put them into one PDF. You can merge them together using Acrobat, or you can put multiple PDFs into a zip file and then just send it in that way too. Uh, the proposal narrative, this is the Word version. You can put the Word version in here to kind of maintain a hard copy. Makes it easier for everybody if we have multiple copies of it. And then to submit your application, uh, you just go down here and you put in any other email addresses that you want for notifications. So let's say that your grants office wants to know uh, about the status of your application. You could put the grants office email address in here, OGC at university.edu, that kind of thing. Um, and then you click on this that says uh, that you uh, accept these terms, that you know you this is a commitment to comply with the re required activities that are listed in the IR that in the RFP if you do get grant funding. Uh, your submitted proposal will serve as the statement of work for uh, your project team because that's part of what the service level agreement is. What it says is uh, we are funding the institution this amount of money for this project and that project's in the statement of work and then the statement of work is your proposal. So be sure that you've really thought over your proposal before you submit it. Um, and then once you're all done with this, you can save it as a draft if you want to um, or you can submit the application if you're already done. Um, this one you would just want to do if you're about halfway through and say yeah I just want to do this later just save it as a draft and that's fine. Uh, submit the application once you're ready. Okay so now that I've completely shown you all of that let's go back over to uh, the PowerPoint so I can show you what the rest of it looks like because that requires screenshots. Okay. So I already talked about the bulleted list. So once you've submitted your application, you'll get an email that says we've received your application. Once uh, I've gone through it and made sure that it actually meets the requirements, unless you've submitted it within a week of the deadline, in which case all of that will just be accepted right at the end in the deadline. Um, 
you'll get a thing that says that your application has been accepted for review. That doesn't mean that your application has been awarded. That's not the notification of award. That's saying this qualifies to be sent out to peer reviewers. That's just about every application. Every so often, um, if you submit it early and I look at it and I find something wrong, I can get back to you and then you can clarify it and we can fix it and then I can accept it. Um, but if you send it in a little bit too late, I'm not going to hold off on sending it to peer reviewers uh, and then you know, hope that you get back to me over the next week or so. That wouldn't be fair to you or to the reviewers. Um, so that'll be automatically accepted at that point. So if you want this to be checked over for errors, uh, submit it early. And then the peer reviewers are going to be reviewing them through the lens of a weighted rubric. Now we've been using a weighted rubric since round 12. Before then, everything was just kind of weighted the same. So for example, the project goals and the transformation action plan and the timeline and the budget all had a five point scale and they were all weighted the same. This time around, it's really four overarching ideas and they're weighted differently based on the priority. So the two big ones, are the transformative impact and the organization and planning and feasibility. So basically, are you saving students money? Are you making substantial changes? Um, and do you have a really good grant proposal? These two things are the highest amount of weight. Are these planned out really well? Are the goals such that we know what's going to happen and we think that it is realistic for it to be carried out. That's very important along with the impact. Um, qualitative and quantitative measures are also very important. Um, not as highly weighted, but still uh, weighted times two. Uh, and these need to be explained in as much detail as you can. If you're going to say, um, we're going to do a survey. Well, OK, that's cool. But how are you going to analyze that? Are you going to? Uh, do just quantitative analysis on it? Are you going to filter by uh, particular responses to that? Are you going to filter it by um, particular student demographics? Do you have access to that demographic data? Uh, if you're looking at learning outcomes, are you able to like break that out into various outcomes? Are you able to uh, determine significance like that kind of stuff is really interesting to me and super interesting to peer reviewers uh, this stuff really needs to get insights into the project in, in the best way that you can so the more the more details that you have on quantitative and qualitative measures the better um, and then clarity and alignment this is the kind of stuff where uh, things are not incorrect and there are not a lot of typos uh, that stuff is not weighed as highly as the rest of this. If you have a great plan and some of the dates are off and the typos are all over the place and I don't, eh, I, I could still totally be fine with that. Peer reviewers could still mostly be fine with that. It's weighted a little bit less. But be sure to at least have one person read over your application before you submit it. Uh, someone who, um, hopefully hasn't been in on the creation process because a lot of times what what will happen is even when I create things if I edit something and then I keep editing and editing and editing and then there are some problems that come about because I've cut things out and added things I just will not see the the difference uh, because it's because I was the author so the best thing to do to keep your clarity and your alignment up to uh, up to speed is to have somebody outside of your grant team uh, read over your application before you send it in. So that is an entire rundown of all of the processes, all the definitions of how these grants work, and it is almost three o'clock, but we have some time for questions. So I'm going to open this up to you, uh, both to the chat and uh, on the phone. So what I'm going to do is just uh, unmute the audience. That doesn't entirely unmute you, but uh, press star six if you want to unmute yourself on the phone and just press the microphone if you want to unmute otherwise.
And now we can see the chat a lot easier here. Um, hey, I have a question, and this is Priya Gojo. Um, and uh, regarding really the rubric, um, you know, the um, uh, the assessment or um, uh, uh, rubric that you just showed. Yes. Now, for, you said you now surveys. Um, you know, uh, surveys are if, but you know, you want to be specific on the surveys. Mm -hmm. Now, but these surveys will really. So it's a plan. It's part of the proposal plan because you cannot do surveys till the implementation is complete. Yes. Right. For so sure. If I have an OER resource and I implement it in spring 2021. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to have. Uh, I might have a pre-test data, but the post-test data is only going to come in at the end of that semester. So is that the plan that? you're looking for in the proposal? So yes, it depends on your plan how this is going to work. Um, for instance, let's say that you're able to get the data on time because what we do is we put the deadline like after the final exams are over, after grading is over, nearly into the next semester most of the time. Um, but let's say that you can't get that data and you can't do the analysis on time. What we can do is just kind of work out uh, a draft final report at that point um, that includes everything but that data. And then once you get that, you can send it in and we can update the final report. And that's not a problem at all. Um, okay, and you just need that plan to be clearly specified as part of the proposal? Yes, as clearly as you can. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing anyone typing anything into the chat box at the moment. All right, so what I'll do right now is stop recording. Um, I will be sharing this archive on the Round 16 RFP page, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we will also be sharing the slides there as well. So let's say that you got here a little bit later than the beginning of the meeting. No problem at all. You'll have the slides and you'll have the entire archive there as soon as I uh, upload the video. So thank you so much for being here. Again, my uh, email address is jeff.galant at usg.edu. Uh, if you have any questions, just send them right my way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.